Douglas Murray, thank you very much for giving us your time. Uh, this will be, I think, widely appreciated in Australia in particular, where you're well known now as a writer, a commentator, an appearer on television programs, uh, a writer of great note. You've written about the strange demise of Europe. Uh, and now you've launched a second book, The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race and Identity, which is also flying off the bookshelves and creating a very great deal of interest. I look forward to talking to you about that. But before I do that, can you just tell us a little about yourself and how you came to your current positioning? Well, I'm, um, I've just turned 40. And i the author of five books. I wrote my first when I was very young, a uh, book of literary biography. Uh, it came out when I was at university at Oxford. And so I've been a writer all my life. Um, I write journalism as well. I uh, write for almost all the newspapers in the UK and various others abroad, including the Australian. Um, and I, it's a rather unusual career path in some ways because uh, I, I think that I'm in an incredibly fortunate position, and I don't underestimate that in any way. And the fortunate position I'm in, as I see it, is that I'm allowed to say things that are true even if they are unpopular or politically incorrect or um, likely to be howled down by some group or other. Um, some people mind that sort of thing, and for some reason probably just having learned along the way, I don't especially. And I think it's the job of the small number of us in any society who are not beholden to some wobbly boss or weak hierarchy to say things that large numbers, if not majorities of people, recognize to be true but cannot say themselves. So that's my self-appointed role. Terrific. Now, before we start to unpack some of uh, the things that you, you do say, can I just say I think the book is fantastic. I was lying in bed this morning uh, early thinking to myself, just for the writing, it ought to be a textbook uh, in schools. Then there's the incredible research, very detailed. But thirdly, the thing that struck me is it takes a lot of guts to do what you've done, regardless of, I mean, you just sort of said you're in a position where you can be your own boss, you can mm -hmm. say what you believe to be true, but it takes a lot of courage. You know, I don't think you're a person who's simply seeking to be controversial. You think truth uh, and deep exploration of issues mm -hmm. actually matters. Yes. Yeah, I, um, there are people who simply seek controversy. I, I don't. I mean, um, the, the uh, British English philosopher Roger Scruton said of me a little while ago that um, I'm actually a very um, amiable person. It's just I've been bullied into being occasionally not amiable by not amiable people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I, I, there is some, there's some truth in this. Uh, I think that all ages engage in forms of self-deception. Yep. And we are very, very good at looking at the past and identifying that. You know, what were they thinking of? How, why did they do that? Um, and we are inevitably rather bad at recognizing that our own age is likely to be doing things that our successors will look back at with at least equal amazement. No. What were they thinking of? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the self-appointed roles of a writer should be identify the things now that we are doing that our successors will recognize to be insane and try to stop doing them early. Sounds terrific uh, line of reasoning to me. Uh, one final point on this issue though. Uh, I think it was Robert Louis Stevenson that once observed, I was a kid and I read that he'd said something like, courage is not knowing no fear. It's pushing ahead and overcoming the fear. Um, yes. The truth is I always say to people that if there's something they're worried about saying which they think is true, they should probably say it anyway, say it early, get used to saying it early, uh, because otherwise you'll find yourself in a whole world of hell where you have to sustain lies, sustain ideas that you know not to be true. It's profoundly demoralizing. It's demoralizing for society and it's demoralizing for an individual. Um, I don't think anything I do is, is courageous. I, I know a lot of very courageous people from all sorts of different walks of life, but 
Um, I think that it would be a very sad situation if telling the truth as you see it was deemed to be any kind of act of courage. Uh, the water is always slightly warmer than people fear. Um, you know, people, uh, people are very fearful of putting, even dipping a toe in to certain issues. So again, I mean, one of my, one of my beliefs is that writers should try to, as I say in The Madness of Crowds, try to clear some of these minefields of our times so that it's safe for everyone else to, or safer for everybody else to cross as well. I think that's very valuable. It fits with Jordan Peterson, who told an audience in Sydney uh, when he was asked a question about being battered by social media. Mm. He said, look, get it out there. After a couple of weeks, the fury blows out mm. and yeah. you can move on. But you've yeah. got it there. You've established a bit of a beachhead. Yeah, and, but also, I mean, I've, I've just not got that much tolerance for the people who think that, for instance, being flamed on Twitter is that big a deal. I mean, uh, you know, my parents grew up in post-war era of rationing and then under the shadow of total nuclear annihilation. My grandparents fought in and lived through the war. We've got it very damn easy in our day. So when people boast about being really attacked on social media, I think, oh yeah, that must be hell for you. Again, useful perspectives. Uh, well, to sail into the book, uh, the contents page tells you that uh, you're not going to back away, uh, <laughs> gay, and then there's an interlude, the Marxist foundations, uh, women, interlude, the impact of tech, race, interlude, on forgiveness, which I found really interesting, and we'll come to that. Uh, four, trans, and then the conclusion, where to from here, what can we do? Now, your thesis, as I understand it, in essence, is that we're living through a postmodern era, the grand meta-narratives of the past have been largely discarded. We've moved away from the Judeo-Christian basis of Western culture. In fact, uh, there seems to be a determined attempt now to de-authorise it and to paint it as evil and terrible and oppressive and cruel. Uh, and even our political structures, all the main political philosophies have essentially broken down. And you see managerialism and ad hocery yeah. uh, and lack of conviction and great cynicism in the community about that. But you're saying we're trying to build a new metaphysics yes. on bases that simply won't sustain it. You say uh, put together as a new foundation blocks, as a foundation blocks of a new morality and metaphysics, uh, they form the basis for a general madness. Indeed, a more unstable basis for social harmony mm. could hardly be imagined. The products of the system cannot reproduce the stability of the system that produce them, and then this very important remark, we're now asked to agree to things that we cannot believe. Yes. I became fascinated, I, I, like you, I had less than you, but I've had to do a fair amount of media in my time. And one of the things I started to notice in the last 15 or so years in particular, was that effectively a new metaphysics, that is the new, a new foundational morality appeared to be getting installed in our society. Um, and it went something like this, uh, and again, one can, one can regret this or admire it, but I think most people will recognize something like it, that uh, not very long ago, uh, if you wanted uh, to be seen to be an ethical or good person, there were certain things that were perhaps expected of you. Broadly speaking, they were the inheritance of the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, and this included things like um, charity, uh, forgiveness, um, virtue as, as understood in that tradition and, and a lot more. And then at some point in the last 15 years, I, I say sped up very clearly in the last 10 years and then weaponized in the last five, uh, we see this another form of, of morality, not totally dissimilar in some of, its, um, some of its appearances. And that is that in order to be a good person, to be seen as a good person in a society like uh, Australia or, or, or Britain, uh, you would need to stress, for instance, that you were anti-racist, as if everybody else in society was profoundly racist and you were one of the few brave souls willing still to battle racism. You would need to present yourself as being entirely on the side of women in any and all circumstances and really talk about it an awful lot. You know, if you're a man, stress your feminist credentials. Uh, 
a tendency which, as you know from reading The Madness of Crowds, I'm intensely skeptical of. You needed to talk about LGBT all the time, or at least as often as possible. And, uh, and these, and, uh, as well as a few other things you might add in, uh, uh, green uh, and uh, perhaps a couple of other things, became what you stress in order to show that you're a good person. Now these, these in the end, I, I started to realize, were becoming load-bearing walls, which I became very worried about and am very worried about because they, don't, they can't bear the load. My view is, is that LGBT rights, equal right rights for women, equal rights for people, whatever their racial origin, is a very desirable end point. But it's an end point of liberalism in the good sense as we might understand it. It's a hideous foundation. Why? For two reasons in particular. The first is that all of these, these bases for a new morality have intense friction among themselves. So as I point out in the trans chapter, trans and women, have intense friction as rights claims for reasons I explained. Trans and gay have intense friction between them for reasons I go into in the madness of crowds. But there's a second reason as well, which is that all of these things that we have been in societies like Australia trying to base our morality on are themselves much more unstable components than we've been willing to admit. So I say in the gay chapter at the outset, and I do gay at the outset partly because it's the only, only one of these minority things I can claim to have any, any crampons on, on the wall of uh, the important Everest of, uh, of liberal rights. Um, uh, gay is much more unstable than we're willing to admit in our society. We still don't know very much about it. Uh, I think we have to be a bit more humble about some of the issues around it as a result of that. But... I get on then to the women chapter and I say, we, this one also is much more unstable than we're, than we're willing to admit. Are women and men exactly equal? Are, is, are men more competent than women in certain areas? Are women more competent than men in certain areas? Or have we just for convenience for the time being landed, for instance, in this strange place I think we're in where we have to pretend that women are exactly the same as men and also magically better? Um, we're very uncertain about this. We tend to be totally certain. We're very uncertain. Race, absolute mess, which we are, we've been trying to think about and deal with as well as we can, but there's a whole load of hell waiting for us if we keep leaning on it this hard. And then trans, which we know almost nothing about, and our societies are pretending to be incredibly certain about. And if I can sum up the problem in this in a sentence, it is that this new morality we're trying to construct relies on us pretending we know about things that we don't know about trans, and simultaneously demands that we pretend not to know about things that we all knew till yesterday relations between the sexes. It's very interesting to me that you clearly spell out your, the thing that you've just said in the book uh, uh, on gays, that there are enormous differences within each grouping under their heading, so gays, uh, lesbians, and so forth, and enormous differences, even frictions, between them. Yes. And in many ways, it's, I would imagine, quite deeply resented. I mean, during the gay marriage debate in Australia, anybody who was watching the debate closely could see there was quite a range of views in the gay community. Right. Quite a range. Sure. And in fact, there were quite a few who said, we've never believed in marriage. Mm -hmm. Why would we want sure. to do it? Yeah, there were some who said, yeah. But of course, you didn't see that in the media. It didn't suit the narrative. You've got other people, it seems, often using, in inverted commas, um, these groupings that they've mm. put together and insist are cogent and right. hang together to pursue amend, uh, 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 agendas of their own. Well, often, often to pursue a specific political objective. Yeah. I mean, I wrote a, a piece in The Spectator in the UK in support of gay marriage before it was popular to be in support of gay marriage and explained what I regard as being the conservative case for it, which was an article which David Cameron used as a basis for his first main speech on the issue. Um, 
I defend it as a right, but I also am worried by and have been worried for a long time by the extraordinary intolerance of elements of the so-called gay community, which I say so-called because there is no such thing. Yeah. I mean, you know. So this is one of the interesting aspects of this. Um, there, there must be, a, there are a lot of gay people who don't want to be defined by sure. their sexuality. Well, just they like, are yeah. a whole heap of other things. Yeah. They're citizens, they're, they might be boilermakers, they might be Sydney you know, city executives or what have you. But suddenly there's an insistence that they define themselves. Yeah, and this is this has come in very recently. And it's come in in each of the ones I describe. And it's a basis for madness. Um, uh, when people say the gay community, who are you talking about? It's like women think this. Oh, really? 50% of the species all agree on something. Uh, blacks say this. Really? Um, now, this is, uh, let me put it another way. If, if somebody said, <laughs> I don't know, um, I just love the working class. They, who? Yeah. Um, I just love the middle class. Who? I love the upper class. Who, who, who are you talking about? And it's the same with this. Why, why, would we be, why would we be falling for this interpretation of society as depending solely or primarily on interest groups based on gender slash sex, sexual orientation, race, and a bit more. Why would we be doing that? Why would we be taking the individualism out of individuals and lumping them in these demonstrably incoherent bodies that don't even exist? They don't even exist. The LGBT community, take me to your leader. Come on. I suppose in a way, you know, in, in public office, the thing that would have struck me about so much of this is that it, it actually ends up dividing us hopelessly. Yes. So we're forever focusing on, the, on our differences, mm -hmm. on the things that divide us as citizens, right. rather than the things that unite us and that we have in common. What if that's the point? Well, that's, what if that's the point? Yeah. So that's your second chapter. Is, is really on uh, on the Marxist on the Marxist yes. thing. Now, 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 this pulling together of of disparate groups who have grievances that can be stoked and sort of, uh, if you like, used as battering rams right. for political objectives, often without them probably even realizing that, in a sense, they're being used. Mm -hmm. That perhaps they're they're the modern version of Lenin's useful idiots. Yeah, yeah. This is um, this is. There's a pattern in all of this. Uh, as I say in that chapter, you can, you can see the intellectual underpinnings. And they come from this idea that if, you, it's, a, it's a Marxist idea, but it's just transferred to the modern era, where instead of talking about society and class structures, you talk about it in minority interest group structures. And you lump people like this. What, what, is, what is the primary aim of this? Um, among other things, it is a different interpretation of society, which is therefore intended to segregate and pull apart societies as you and I might understand them. So that people's primary affiliation is not that I'm an Australian, yeah. but or I'm British, but I'm a member of the LGBT community in the greater Sydney area, for instance. Um, you can predict with 100% accuracy the people who encourage this, the people who will grab the latest claim by an interest group and run with it. And it is always people, always people, who in the past had another way of trying to attack our societies, had a radical Marxist view of the world, for instance. We know this with the green issue where, and again, like, like the rights issues I write about in this book, they succeed because they're not onto nothing, you know. Um, the green uh, uh, movement is onto something with the environment and with our planet, but it has this hideous red interior which keeps exposing itself yeah. as desiring not, not a better relationship between ourselves and our environment, but for instance, the end of capitalism. Yeah. And it's the same with this. Uh, I expose in each of the chapters that the people who make it repeatedly and desperately plain that they believe, for instance, that being a woman 
is, should be merely the first step in a wider mission to bring down capitalism. Now, I don't think most women are on board with that, and most women would be rather surprised to be utilized mm. in this fashion. Mm. But that is very clearly and explicitly, and I quote the, the various scholars and writers who've been pushing this for, for, for years, this is explicitly the aim. And it's why, as I say, you can always predict exactly who is going to latch onto the latest claim. When, when for instance, the big bearded man yes. with male genitalia wins the women's weightlifting competition, you can predict with 100% accuracy who is going to say, yeah, what's the problem with that? And the people who are going to say, hmm, I'm not sure Clive the big weightlifter should be winning the women's category. You can predict it. And the people who say, why have you got a problem with that bigot? Are always the same people who believed in the past that our societies needed to be pulled apart in another fashion. And now they'd like to do it in this fashion. So <clears throat> this uh, what might be called, I think accurately, cultural Marxism. People groan mm -hmm. and say, oh, here we go again. Yeah. But in reality, it is the case, isn't it, that from the 20s on, Frankfurt School in the 30s, you had Gramsci and so forth saying there's a problem in the overthrow of capitalism. The working classes are not rising up. Yes. They were always a letdown. They're always a letdown. They haven't done the job for us. So we need to find a different way to achieve yes. the same objectives and it's to attack the cultural underpinnings of Western society. In particular, I would have thought things like uh, capitalism itself, um, uh, democracy, Nation of course, state. but also Christianity and the yeah, churches yeah. and family. Mm -hmm. Family. So the, the great loser out of a lot of this, frankly, I would say these culture wars are our children. Yeah, you know, we've deconstructed the family in yeah. so many ways, and there's further attacks the environment in which our kids grow up. Yeah, I've never quite understood how, though, the cultural Marxists manage to so capture academia in the West, and particularly, it seems to me, in the English-speaking countries. Oh well, that's yeah, that's that's easy. I mean, <laughs> they first of all, um, academics can be. I think, fairly characterized as not among the bravest people in the world. Um, that once they get um, tenure, they become very comfortable in the position. They are, this isn't always the case, but they are to a considerable extent, as long as they tick the right boxes and have the right views, an unusual beast in nature and they have no predator. Um, they are, able to have a very comfortable position in which they can, should express perhaps uncomfortable discoveries. But the comfort of recent decades has become the comfort of espousing and following a basically culturally Marxist view of the world. Um, I, I, the, the literature, the evidence of this is so overwhelming now, particularly from America, it has to be said. And there are, in, there are reasons within that why that's the case. I mean, look at the amount of money that, is now, that, that people now run up to get an, an education in America. Uh, it's happening in the UK as well. But if you, if you massively increase the number of people who, who, who go to university and think they should go to university, um, you, you can't keep up a system that rewards people for having gone to those universities. And you create a Ponzi scheme, which is what a ca academia has to a great extent become, where social science departments grow and grow, where the human resources departments grow and grow. I can't remember the, the multiple now, but it's only like three or four times more money is now spent in the American Academy on the purely bureaucratic elements of it than even 20 years ago, which means that young people in countries like America are running up massive debt in a Ponzi scheme that cannot reward them because there aren't roles at the end of it for all of these people with the degrees they're given. I think, by the way, there's a massive amount of resentment coming in the next few years from the people who realize they've been had. I think this is one of the great dangers, frankly, for Western society. It I is. agree with you. Uh, but, 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 to go back to the origins of why academics might be in this position, I mean, let me put it another way, and this is one that make, will make me enormously unpopular with some remaining friends in academia, but it's also the case that to a great extent this isn't where the bright people have gone in recent years. Um, 
tell me, outside of specific sciences and competencies, tell me a situation where in the last 20 years, we would say, this is a really big problem. Let's go to the universities and ask them for the answer. Um, when, when in recent decades we've had massive issues, have we been saying, we must ask the professors what they think? No, we haven't, for all sorts of reasons, but one of them is they're not very good at giving us the answers anymore. And, and by the way, the, the place you'd go last for an answer would be the gender studies department of a West Coast university. You know, let's go and see what they can tell us about the sexes. Oh, there aren't sexes. There's just a hundred genders, including two spirit people we just invented yesterday. Oh, great. They're useful. This is a useful department. Thank goodness kids are getting into massive debt being lied to by these people. Um, they've, they've, lost, they've lost in large part the competence they had. And I think that there's all sorts of reasons for that. As I say, among other things, a massive expansion of that sector beyond where it should have gone. Mm. Well, astonishing. And one of the reasons it matters now is that such a high proportion of young people in the West go through university. Yeah. And then they filter out into teaching our children, into the media, uh, into all sorts of influential places. Now the boardrooms, they've become right. centres of great wokeness. Yes. In our country. Yes, of course they have. I mean, it used to be said the only small c conservatives you would find in a university were generally in the economics departments. They would also always have Marxists in the economics departments. Uh, but you would, you would, you'd often find that was where some conservatives were because the economics still needed conservative thought. That's not the case so much anymore. And it's certainly not the case in the humanities. And the evidence and the the, what studies have been done show just the overwhelming preponderance of Marxists, self-identifying socialists and others. You know, I've often said in recent years, and the only place you can really find open, radical Marxists after the Cold, the Cold, uh, the Cold War closes is in the university system, although now we also have it in our political system, so that's a development. I have to say I'm still amazed at how willingly, how readily, how lazily people give up that much heralded sort of pursuit of evidence-based reasoning, problem solving, mm -hmm. that surely lies at the heart of Western progress. Well, um, but I accept your thesis. One, one I way don't of, argue it. I well, just... well, one way of also thinking about this, I think, is the pursuit of truth has now got a massive blockade in its way, and the blockade is me. I, the self, um, so that you and I know this, uh, and we, we, there are so many examples of it, some of which I give in the book, but don't go into that very difficult area. Why shouldn't I go into this very difficult area? Because it offends me. Yeah. Now, the obvious thing that the adults in the room do at that point is, so, so, now we have become hostage to these people, any people, anyone who says, don't go there, it offends me. And we step back. And as I, like the other issues I mentioned earlier, there's a good reason for that. There's an advantage, which is, generally speaking, in our societies, we recognize that being nice to people is better than not being nice to people, that being polite and not offending people is a good idea. It's not been a view throughout human history and it's not globally at the moment. But, but in, in societies like Australia, we, broadly speaking, we. Okay, I'm sorry I offended you. I'll try to avoid that. Um, but if this means that there are whole areas we don't look into, let me give, give an example quickly. Um, the issue of child rearing, child production, parenthood. Um, there are a whole set of very, very painful issues within that. Almost unending number of painful issues. And a lot of truths that need to be said and a lot of facts that need to be explored. Many things, though, we, we know about. We've been doing it for long enough as a species. Um, however, if somebody says, if even one person says in a room, that offends me, we are likely to step back because we're treading on one of the most painful, important things in the person's life. Um, so we're hostage to that. And it means that you can very easily 
as a society, once you say we're not going to talk about or explore difficult and painful things, it's very easy as a society as a result to fall back and rely on lies or untruths. And you now see the consequences of this. I'm now 40. I see the consequences of it in my contemporaries who, for instance, were told at the outset of their careers, you can have everything. Yeah. That was an easy thing to tell people. It was a nice thing to tell people. It was a very encouraging thing to tell people. And it was also a little bit untrue. This is really important stuff. I was talking to one of my neighbours at home in rural Australia, a highly intelligent man, very thoughtful man, very pragmatic man. And he said to me, John, you worry too much about this stuff. People have got a lot of common sense. But he's got three kids. They're being educated yeah. in systems now mm. where this madness has taken over. My interpretation of your society, correct me if I'm wrong, this is an audacious thing to explain to an Australian, and afterwards you can explain Britain to me. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was in Australia last summer, summer before last, and I was very struck, I did a multiple city tour. I was very struck by the fact that I thought that that, the, I have relied, um, and I'm sure this happens the other way around, I've relied in recent years on the assumption that your average Australian retains a common sense that is perhaps absent from the average American these days, uh, not to mention perhaps the average Brit. That there was some um, core of we haven't got sense. quite as far down the road yeah. as the way we would normally put it. And while that may be true for many people, I was very struck in city after city in yeah. Australia and in New Zealand that what I describe in the madness of crowds was, was at its yeah. absolute heart in your country. Yeah. That, and I, I was trying. I've been trying to work out because I wrote a little bit of Aust about Australia in the my previous book, in *The Strange Death of Europe*, as well as you know about the immigration question, and specifically on the historical guilt issues. And it seems to me, among other things, that and I would love you to correct me on this, but it seems to me, among other things, that Australia has had a massive shift in its sense of itself in Isn't your it? lifetime. Yep. And that, as yep. a result, it's Huge. become very vulnerable Huge. to this yes, sort it of. Has. I agree with that. Right. And another man who'd agree with both of us is Frank Ferruti. Now, he would not identify on the political spectrum where you and I might, but he too would say, yeah, Australians still display a lot of common sense, et cetera, et cetera. But I said to him, uh, do you think our universities have avoided the worst of this? And he looked at me quick, sharply, and he said, no, I think you've fallen lazily mm. into the worst yes. of the British and American yes. tracks. But to come to the Australian psych, because there's something I want to draw out here. You think of uh, perhaps our most renowned sportsman, certainly the one that I think I respect most personally, long gone, of course, now, Donald Bradman. Right. Unbelievable uh, Australian cricketer. What was he known for, his character? And it was seen to epitomise what we thought mattered in character. He was extraordinarily gracious in victory and humble in defeat. Mm -hmm. Other way round. He was extraordinarily gracious in defeat and humble in victory. We admired him right. enormously. He was a legend for that. At what point in Western culture did pride, which is another word for self-centeredness, eclipse humility as a premier value, something to celebrate, if you like? Well, it comes down to the, the same um, axle shift as everything else, which is, Broadly speaking, did you think your society was a force for good or was it evil from the start? Uh, since 1945, every Western society has gone through this shift at some point, usually for similar reasons. And again, the basis of it has some good things, accounting for historical errors for instance. By the way, the oddity of this is that, for instance, all the countries that are, that are made to feel worse at the moment are the places with the least reason to feel worse. I mean, we don't see massive self-interrogation in China. No. There's a reason. There's a reason. And there's a reason, by the way, which we should be proud of in our countries, which is perhaps, perhaps the free countries 
one of our freedoms is to beat up on ourselves. Yeah, I agree. Sure, but... We have the capacity to self-examine mm -hmm. and work our way to a better position, which right. is a large part of the thesis of your book. But the, We've but, done it well, but having almost arrived at the railway station, suddenly we've decided we've made no progress at all, we've gone backwards, we're yes. absolutely terrible and the trains just run off down the platform. That's right, that, 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 that a new attraction. generation comes along with, the, with believing in many cases, I mean, having been lied to, that societies like Australia and Britain are the most racist societies on yeah. earth, or the most sexist societies on earth, or homophobic, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, compared to which societies precisely in the world. Um, so the staggering lack of geographical and historical context in our countries. I mean, this is another, this is another failing of the university system. If the university system had merit, it would it would be inculcating in young people, among other things, a sense of damn gratitude for starters, just for starters, um, uh, some sense of perspective on the world. I mean, I've been very lucky in my career. I've traveled extremely widely across every continent in the world. And one of the things I know everywhere I go is how lucky I've been, how lucky I've been to be born in the society I've been born into at the time I was born here. Privileged? Even privileged, and and it's such and, a hard thing to measure, as you say in the book. But I, yes, I interrupt. but mm. um, but as I say, all of our societies at some point got shifted onto this idea that actually we weren't very good, we weren't very virtuous, that we'd done so much wrong, and this is where we become susceptible, enormously susceptible to anybody who claims to have a different way of doing things and who claims to have the answer, for instance, to everything. Let me just tease this out a little. The loss of historical knowledge, mm -hmm. of background, seems to me to be terrible. I don't think you can work out where you are, where you want to go, if you can't establish where you've come from. Yes. Basic map reading, if you like, it seems to me. Now, one of the great lessons I would have thought of history is that to deny, to deny people freedom of conscience, belief, religion is to deny, to deny them the most fundamental freedoms of all. And again, Frank Ferruti made this point. He said the first freedom in a way in the West was freedom of conscience. We yes. stopped burning one another at the yeah. stake because it was barbaric, it was not Christian, and it was also stupid. Today's minority may turn out to be tomorrow's majority. You talk about that a bit that it appears that some people who have been pushing for rights, having achieved them, then turn the jackboot that they once yes. were on the receiving end around and attack others. Yes. In yes. fact, you make, uh, there's something in here that really jumped out at me. Uh, you said almost immediately after gay marriage became legal in Germany, acceptance of it was made a condition of citizenship yes. in the state of uh, Baden-Württemberg. A condition yeah. of citizenship. Yeah. Can I ask for yeah. a start? Where does that leave the left, those figures in a free country, they're right to believe this, who don't believe in marriage at all? They suddenly have to say, <laughs> right, we do actually sign up and we now believe in marriage yes. and its new version. But where Only do... for gays. <laughs> That's absurd. That is to deny no, everything that our own history's taught us. See, I would mm -hmm. be one who'd say, we ought to learn our history. So much of it has given us the freedoms that we mm. have. But if you want to understand where we've gone wrong, we can mm -hmm. learn from the things we've gone wrong as well. We're not prepared to even learn the mm -hmm. things we got wrong or from the things that we got wrong, yeah. let alone the things we got right. Well, one of the reasons why the, the, the new metaphysics, new religion I describe in this book is identifiable is because the people who follow it behave with all the zealotry that religious fanatics have behaved with in the past. It's not enough that they believe something, you have to believe it too. Um, I wrote in The Spectator recently about the, uh, it's, a minor, it's, a, it's a minor thing, but uh, there's a restaurant in America called Chick-fil-A. Yes, I saw that article. Um, Chick-fil-A, uh, some of the people, the fa family, it's a Christian family business. Um, Pretty big chain, I It's understand. a big chain, third largest chain uh, restaurant in America. Opened uh, um, uh, uh, for the first time in the UK uh, in October and uh, announced shortly afterwards that it's closing uh, because of protests by local self-appointed gay activists. Uh, because Chick-fil-A in America, the Christian family who found it, 
gave donations about 10 years ago to a family charity, family uh, oriented charities, which included opposition to gay marriage and so on and so forth. Now, here's the thing with that, like with the Equinox gym controversies in the summer in the US, is it's not enough that that these people choose not to eat their chicken nuggets at this place. You mustn't either. And they mustn't serve chicken nuggets and they must close. Well, even if the family who run Chick-fil-A are the most opposed to gay marriage ever, I still think if some people want to eat their chicken nuggets, they should have the damn right to do so. But that, that instinct is not there in the social justice warriors of our time. It's not just that they don't want the thing, they don't want you to do the thing either, or to have the right to do the thing, because only by total decimation of their enemies can they win. Yeah. That isn't liberalism no. in any interpretation of the term, yeah. any interpretation. And how does it fit with the insistence of gays in America, for example, but also we see this in Australia, that, um, you know, the, the, the baker issue, the mm -hmm. uh, uh, baking of a wedding cake. Oh, no, no, you, you cannot possibly exercise your conscience uh, if a gay couple want mm. a wedding cake, you must provide it. Mm. How does it fit well, with the right on the other side to close a business down oh, yeah. because it has a different perspective? How about going back to the courage issue? Maybe these people are all just incredibly cowardly and lazy. Maybe that's all that's going on. You see, it, it's, it's quite easy to say, I refuse to eat my chicken nuggets at that place in Reading. That's quite easy. I mean, I've spent all my life ducking eating chicken nuggets in Reading. I, I can keep doing it if I want. Uh, um, but, but it's, if you think that's the main issue in that rights issue, it means, among other things, you can avoid the harder ones. Well, here's a harder one. There are still dozens of countries in the world where it's illegal to be gay. There are still around a dozen countries where you can be executed for being gay. If you're a gay rights activist, mightn't that be a place to start? Mightn't that be, a, mightn't that be one closer to the boat? As it happens, I know nobody's meant to say anything at all uh, um, praising of him, but as it happens, Donald Trump has said he wants to make this a priority, actually. The, he is, his administration is looking at trying to stop the countries which still make being gay illegal from doing so. They're going to tie it to aid and all sorts of other things. That strikes me as being a very good, laudatory gay rights move. Let's, let's, make, let's try to make sure that there's nowhere in the world you get hanged or stoned for being gay. It's also, for, for many individuals, a bit of a hard one. Why? Well, it means you have to make a value judgment means you have to say, actually, I think the way we do things in our society is better than the way they do in that society. Well, oh, that's we know, cultural imperialism. D deep cultural imperialism. Who are you to say that they shouldn't shove the wall on the gays? Um, and again, much of the lazy, cowardly social justice movements that pretend that they're incredibly brave don't want to get into that. Run an awfully long way very fast. Hmm. Power seems to be at the heart of a lot of this new, if I can put it this way, anger, mm -hmm. uh, this sort of desire to uproot everything. Why is it that we don't see the pursuit of power for the ugliness that it is? I mean, Acton was surely right. We should be wary of power. It does corrupt. An absolute power does tend towards uh, absolute to corruption. We don't seem to value things like love, harmony, community, mm. turning the other cheek, forgiveness. Mm. They seem to be under ruthless attack as belonging to an era we despise, which enjoyed a Christian conception, uh, uh, consensus uh, in terms yes. of, of the way we viewed the world and our neighbour. Well, it, one of the striking things about going to societies that are radically different from your own and why it's worth doing is because it can wipe you of some of your presumptions about what the natural state of mankind is. Yeah. You know? Um, a lot of people in countries like Australia who think that, for instance, loving your neighbor is the natural default condition of people, have an awful shock coming to them, not just in their own countries where, of course, nobody can 
entirely live up to that very strenuous command. But in all sorts of countries and societies around the world where people act and behave differently, where the state of nature is, is, is different, um, our societies put a premium, or did put a premium in the past, as you mentioned earlier, the cricketer example, on magnanimity and victory, for instance, um, humility and defeat, or graciousness and defeat, among other things. These are not the natural defaults. These are learned behaviors, learned because there was a deeper undertow beneath them that told you that these things were worthwhile. Charity, for instance, is not the state of nature of mankind to be charitable, let alone charitable to people you haven't even met and are very unlikely to meet. These are learned behaviors, taught behaviors, from a very specific tradition. That isn't to say that other traditions don't have elements of it themselves. They do. They have versions of it. But our societies today have become fixated in the post-Christian era, have become fixated on power as the primary dynamic and understanding mechanism for human society. And my view is, as I say in the part about Foucault in this book, I think this is a really deeply perverted way to look at society, where we interpret interest groups and others as forever scurrying to achieve power, and we entirely ignore what for most of us remain the more important drivers in our lives. If you were to say to somebody, what drives you? If you went up to the average person in Melbourne and said, what drives you? If they said power, <laughs> you'd step away slowly. More likely they would say something along the lines of um, love for my family, friends. They might have a wider group of people they express that towards community, town, civic, perhaps even nation, um, they wouldn't say power. Now, the reason why we're bad at talking about this is, among other things, because it's a more embarrassing, icky thing to talk about than power. To tr purely look at power dynamics, are the men powerful over the women, are white people powerful over people of color, and so on and so on ad infinitum, is that it's slightly easier to do than to talk about the flip side of that, which is love, forgiveness, charity, and more. And I think conservatives have been bad about talking about some of this, as other people have. Um, conservatives in recent decades have to a great extent thought that the point of their philosophy is to talk about the marketplace and economics and leave the rest. That's been a disaster. Been a disaster. Uh, one thing that brought it home, uh, I'm, I'm reviewing a book at the moment, in which he, uh, an economist has written uh, about the collapse of Lehman. Mm. And when you actually, uh, his thesis is essentially that the abandonment of the classic virtues, prudence, integrity, courage, and so on and so forth, was what led to that frightful mess. Mm. In other words, the abandonment of morality mm. has disastrous economic outcomes. And conservatives have by and large missed that, as I think... Yeah. Those who might have been classic liberals are now mm -hmm. small L libertarians, by and large, have missed it as well. And short-termism. And they played right into the hands of those who dislike capitalism in the first place. Yes. I mean, well, there's been, I mean, because capitalism has produced a better system than any other system we know of, of course, doesn't mean it doesn't have flaws within it. And one of the flaws always has been... Um, short-termism, it's why, why family businesses can often be so successful is because, as you know, the, um, uh, if you were to raid the whole thing, strip it, present a false version of itself, you're going to suffer for it. Um, there's a phenomenon I've often noticed of family businesses, for instance, ending up in the hands of outsiders who squeeze, maximize yeah. profits because they want to run off quite shortly afterwards yeah. and having made their pile. Um, a conservative approach to this, a small c conservative approach to this, among other things, would say, but this is, a, this is an immoral thing to do yeah. in itself because it's not your right to simply squeeze the value that's been accumulated by others, run away with it, and then allow it to collapse. That's not a decent thing to do. There have, by the way, there are versions of this, in, I'm sure there are in Australia, there have been quite 
public versions of people who are now being shamed for that kind of behavior. Oh, absolutely. And it's yeah. very, I think it's a, yeah. I think it's a positive step. Uh, people like Philip Green, who uh, asset stripped a, a major um, high street chain here in it's the UK. It's a good thing it's being exposed, yeah. but it's a terrible thing that it's happening. And it's, there's a sense in which it starts to wind back freedoms, doesn't it? We had a commission of inquiry, right. you know, the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the banks and the financial sector in Australia. It revealed uh, some terrible behaviour. To be fair, a lot of people behave very decently and they get tarred with the same brush. But nonetheless, there's a massive problem. And the reaction is people say, oh, thank heavens we had the Royal Commission of Inquiry. Now we can have 78 new sets of pieces of legislation, more surveillance, more monitoring, greater fines. And then we find that credit starts to become a problem because everybody becomes cautious. So the problem in essence is that the bankers weren't asking themselves what they ought to do, right. rather what can we get away with. There is a, um, there's an additional problem we've uh, put upon our shoulders, which is there are, I, I, I'm sure the Germans would have a term for this, but there are, there are categories of problem which we, we don't address because the only people who've been trying to address them are people with the worst possible answers. Capitalism, I think, falls into this basket. Um, uh, the people who have been critiquing it the most for many years have made a lot of other people not want to critique it because those people who've been critiquing it all along have an answer and it's Marxism. Yes, yeah. So we avoid, the, we avoid yeah. having the discussion because yeah. we simply don't want, it's the same thing with the inequality discussion, yeah. I, I think, yeah. which is that there, is a, there are so many discussions to have about inequality and, the, and actually there's been quite a lot of literature about them, about that issue over the decades. It's sort of been run through already. Uh, it's, it's nothing new, that debate that we're going through. But it's very striking to me that, again, the political rights tended to avoid the inequality dis debate. Why? Because the people who've been thinking about it have an answer. It's Marxism. Yeah, sure. And yeah. we want to be absolutely sure if we have that conversation yeah. that they're not going to smuggle Marxism in when we're not looking. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I can go back, though, to this issue of the way in which we've actually completely turned on its head now the beliefs and values mm. that underpinned Western society. I mean, we really have. I mean, the Christian model of relationship with your neighbour is established by the idea of Christ dying on a cross, not for his friends even, but for his enemies. Mm -hmm. You know, turn the other cheek. Yeah. Um, do unto others as you'd have them do unto yourselves. Um, and then the, I suppose the sort, of the, the sort of minimalist version of that, at least do no harm out of mill. Right. But it's all gone. We've actually reversed it all together in the, in, in, in the interests of the big me, of selfism, of mm -hmm. radical autonomy that says, I will do with my life and my body and my money and my time and my relationships what I choose. Yes. We've actually inverted mm -hmm. the worldview, uh, if you like, that, that drove our freedoms. And I think... For me, as someone of Christian belief, the greatest question, I mean, I accept that people have absolutely the right to choose or not choose faith, but the greatest check, a question of all, the greatest challenge for the secularists is on what basis will we no. establish a workable respect for others because no society of a democratic tradition can possibly survive, I, I, I believe, it's impossible to survive if you can't find a basis, a rational basis that's powerful enough to change people's behaviour so that we break free. I mean, you make a good point. We're reverting to type. Mm. Progressives say we're moving endlessly to a better future. But in reality, as you say from looking at other societies as you travel the world, we're losing, if you like, what we had and reverting rather than progressing. Well, what's the single hardest commandment within Christianity? Um, you can get almost everything of Christianity from earlier or other sources. You can get almost everything of Christianity of Jesus' teachings from uh, the ancient Greeks. Um, a lot of the wisdom is very similar. What is the thing that is totally revolutionary about what Jesus says. It's the commandment to love your enemies. Yes. I mean, that is a 
and demonstrated in Christian belief yeah. by him actually dying for his enemies. He was dying for them. This is this is this is a world historical change of com- a, a, a command that demands a world historical change. My own view of this is that it is possible in individuals on occasions with exceptional grace um, and that it, is, that it is almost impossible for most people most of the time. But that the commandment to, to do that at the very least reigns in the worst of our nature. That knowing how we should behave ideally means that we can step back from the worst of ourselves, which we know and intuit. Um, This is not an easy thing to replicate without its foundational claim, which is the foundational claim, the truth claim made within Christianity. It's what I I quote in The Strange Death of Europe, the the German uh, uh, jurist, uh, Bockenforder, who posed this question in the 1960s. Can a society, can a society, uh, the the sort of short version of his his, um, challenges, can a society continue in the same manner if the thing that gave the source to the society is itself now cut off. And as I say in The Strange Death of Europe, possibly for a time when you're running on the the fumes still of that invocation. Um, Can it sustain forever? No, because if if you don't believe in the driving force of it, then once the people who did believe it have died out, you're, you're, you're still going on a memory of it, and then that dies out. So this is a very big challenge, and it's a challenge which I think the intersectionalists and the social justice warriors and so on have knowingly or otherwise recognized, which is why they're trying to dig in a new metaphysics fast, the metaphysics of LGBT, women, race, etc. And I can only say I am absolutely convinced that the thesis of your book is right. That cannot sustain Mm. a free, functioning, workable society. It just isn't. It's hopelessly inadequate to the task. Hopelessly inadequate and divisive and doesn't provide very much meaning. Um, uh, But so so here's, here's here's a big challenge, and I wish I could get more people to think about this. I, I given the chapter on forgiveness in the madness of crowds, as you know, a, um, a challenge, which is we live in the most unforgiving era that history could ever have known because we live in an era in which action in the world, as Hannah Arendt uh, puts it in the essay of hers, I quote, an essay of hers in the early 50s, action in the world was always our biggest problem as human beings because we, we could never undo our actions, and we always knew that. It's, uh, it's th- th- one of the main catastrophes of being a human. Yes. We don't know how our words will reverberate. We don't know how our actions will reverberate. And we can never undo them. Never. What's the only mechanism, as Anne, Hannah Arendt said, what's the only mechanism we ever came up with to try to deal with this terrible catastrophe? It's forgiveness or something yes. like forgiveness. It's a, a mechanism to try to undo the undoable thing. Now, nobody in our societies today spends any time thinking about forgiveness at the moment in history when acting in the world has never been more precarious, where a young person can tweet yes. and destroy their lives yeah. like that. Yeah. Where they a modern can, burning, of the, a burning of the state. And it can you happen can cancel to someone, anyone all the they time. They take their life. Yeah. It, uh, it can post it's the happening. wrong photo on Facebook. I give examples in yeah. the book. Terrible, pitiful examples. of you know, And I, I, that's why I sort of resent the... The looking, the looking to millennials and after as being snowflakes, or you know, I say they've got a, they've got a very good reason to be worried and to be tiptoeing like never before. Yeah. Because say the wrong thing, which everyone's only agreed is the wrong thing twenty four hours ago, and you're toast. You're over. You, you may not ever get a job. You're online forever. For the, you're stuck with your worst joke, your worst photograph, your, your only slip. We, thank goodness, grew up in an era before this where we could make mistakes and they weren't with us forever. Mm. So, so there's two aspects to that, really. There's forgiveness and forgetting. And Rabbi Jonathan Sachs mm. observed that um, with the abandonment of the main source of the concept uh, of forgiveness and our insistence that we practice it to the best of our ability 
and that we look to it for relief when we know we've done the wrong thing in our society, the Judeo-Christian influence, with its loss, its washing out. So the, I said to him, well, what happens when that's gone? He said, well, you have to hope that people will forget, but the age of social media makes that impossible. So you have neither forgiveness nor the capacity to forget. It's pretty devastating for young people. It's a devastating situation. I'm very sympathetic to young people growing up and they need a lot of yeah. help and advice and care and love, I think, to try to get through this. And the adults have a disproportionate duty to help them. I mean, they always did, but they, especially now. So the adults should be careful um, about joining in the retributive era. Here's the other thing, a bigger point, if I may, which is um, we don't know exactly what we're doing. Maybe we never did, but it's worth trying to think of answers. Your answer and the answer of a lot of people is we knew what we were doing till not long ago. So why don't we, as we're going through this unbelievable fog at the moment, why don't we re-moor ourselves? Re-moor ourselves to our origins in religion, faith. That's, that's one answer. And by the way, it's so striking that that answer is not given by the churches themselves. I mean, the with place, honorable exceptions. With some honorable exceptions, but by and large, the, the, the bishops, certainly in the Anglican Communion, where Archbishop Welby was once again this week discussing Brexit, uh, um, in a society where the archbishops talk about Brexit an awful lot and not very much about the resurrection, the church turns out to be one of the last places you'd go for Christianity. Um, that's a terrible, terrible letdown by the churches who've decided, in large part, to jump on the bandwagons of the day, to jump on green, to jump on social justice issues, and so on. In the it belief seems to me you emasculate Christianity if you make it captive to the reigning culture. Yes, and, uh, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why people flee. But the churches, at any rate, should, and those who, who, who follow the teachings of the churches, should, I think, much more distinctly say there's a reason why we hold on to this still and there's a reason why we think it would be good for you as well. Now, for all sorts of reasons I've, I've written about in my last book, um, I'm not in the position of being a believer myself, although I probably like various others, I describe myself as a believer in belief. Uh, and certainly a beneficiary of elements of it. Um, I think that those who are in the position I am in on this also have a lot of work, if not a lot more work to do. And particularly for and with young people on this, because we all have the same questions we always had as a species. We try to work out what the hell it is we're doing here. We don't really believe we're just a collection of atoms, do we? I don't think we do. I think that there's something very instinctive in us. I, I, one shorthand I say for this is, um, if, you said to, if you said to me, well, as a consumer, Douglas, and I said, well, I mean, <laughs> sure, I mean, I'm a, I'm a consumer, I consume things, I buy things and consume them, but- But there's a bit more to it There's a bit that. more, okay. I sense- You're not just a consumer. I sense there's more to myself than that. As you do, as we all do. Yeah. And that's why... We don't live as though we think we're a collection of atoms. Right. Um, we, don't, we don't live as if we're merely the thing we have that we are in. It, there's, a, there's a very deep sense in which ourselves know something about ourselves. We find it extremely hard to communicate. But we know it. And this instinct is to the generation growing up now in the West, this instinct is only being spoken to by people saying, okay, there's a dearth of meaning, but you can find it. You can find it in endless retributive wars for justice issues on small and smaller minority points. So you will find meaning in the world by insisting that the big bearded guy with a penis can win the women's weightlifting competition or the people that say otherwise are bigoted. Go for it, guys. Now, at the end of this process, there is a presumption that, there is a presentation that 
somehow we get to utopia, you know, that within our lifetimes utopia is graspable and it looks like total equality for everyone all the time. And even if we got there, and I would submit that we're never going to, we never could, things can be better, but they're never going to get there. Even if we did, what do we do then? We're still stuck with the same questions about ourselves and for ourselves. And I have some answers to that, some suggestions for that, um, which largely rely on suggesting to people that we should live the lives we recognize to be good lives until yesterday. And that lives of meaning can be found in the 21st century, not with great ease, with significant challenge, with an awful lot of work, a lot of commitment, but they can be achieved, and that deep meaning can still be found. But the first thing people need to do is to realize that it cannot be found in the things that are being offered. And so, in a way, what I've tried to do with the Madness of Crowds is to say, I'm going to take apart this thing you're being offered to show you why it isn't going to work. And I'm doing that because I want to then say, do something better with your lives. What is better? Almost anything other than this. But get off this. Get off this fast. Don't waste a minute more of your life on this, on working out where you are in a hierarchy on working out when you have a right to speak or think or how privileged you are or how privileged you are compared to the person beside you or the person to your left or your right or in front of you and where you're allowed to speak and where you're allowed to think in this world. Don't spend a minute longer doing this game, this unwinnable, horrible game. Because we live in an era in history where we could do so much. We have access to information that we never dreamt of when we were growing up. I can, I can get to the source of a, any book at a click of a finger, press of a button. We can save so much time. Um, we can get access to so much. If you're a smart person anywhere in the world, in the developing world or the developed world, and you have access to YouTube and to Google, you can do miracles that your ancestors collectively could never have done. So why spend our time doing the retribution privilege game? Why not work out what we should be doing and start doing it? Well, Douglas, I don't think you could finish on a more important note. I think the one thing I would say as someone who admires your work enormously and thinks that you've provided an invaluable service with this book. You've given us a mirror, which if we look into it, shows us just how ugly our state is. And surely any thinking person can only respond by saying, I need to rethink, is to encourage you to use that very powerful mind you've been blessed with. Uh, see it as a gift to all of us to keep teasing out those answers. For me personally, uh, who has you know, if you like, in over my lifetime, come to a profound belief that the resurrection was real. Uh, I have to say that I think we need ex something extraordinarily powerful mm. to change ourselves. In other words, we can only be renewed by the transforming of our minds, and that is no small thing. But thank you so much for the way in which you tell us so much about ourselves and challenges so deeply, it's, it's admirable. And I wish you all the very best with it. It's a pleasure.